It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dave Allen, founding director of Nile, the Norwich Institute for Language Education, as our plenary speaker this morning. Nile has over 18,000 teachers and trained from 60 countries in the last 15 years. They offer the whole gamut of services from CELTA and DELTA or through to Masters. But for any more information about Nile services, please feel free to meet Dave at the Nile stand after this session. So, Dave will be presenting this morning on the theme of taking T, testing, evaluation, assessment, into the 21st century. Please show your customary appreciation for Dave. Thank you very much. Hi everybody and thank you very, very much for coming. I don't often get an audience this big for something which has over many years been a bit of a Cinderella subject. It's only when it's testing or assessing conferences that I actually see this many people in front of me. While you were having coffee and relaxing and chatting, I was in here trying to get myself set up. And uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, I get butterflies still, I don't normally panic. Most of my colleagues who know me think I'm the most unflappable of people. But about 10 minutes ago, I was flapping. I knew that I had to use my own laptop in order to do this session, because I've got links that involve codes, and I can't work off anybody else's laptop to get them. And uh, as I went and, and, and asked how I could link up from over there where I began, uh, blank looks and people saying, oh, you can't, we can't use your laptop, we've got to use ours. And I was as near as panic as I've ever been for a long, long time. But thanks to the good work of everybody around, I've ended up back up here and uh, able to do the session. What I'm going to be talking about is taking tea into the 21st century. Not taking tea in the 21st century. I wouldn't be very good at that because I drink coffee. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is to explore with you and share with you the experiences that I've had over working in this particular field for quite a long time. The reason I'm standing here now is something that happened a long, long time ago. I was working as a teacher at Bell in Cambridge, and I had no particular interest in testing at all, and I thought basically testing was about giving marks and grades, what I now call the summative side of testing. And then, to my complete surprise, having had an interview for the job of DOS, Director of Studies, at Bell in Norwich, I got the job. Went up to Norwich in 1975, and 1975 was a key year in the development of language teaching, for those who go back that far. Some of you here wouldn't have been born then, but uh, I can still remember back to that particular mid-period of the 70s, which was the beginning of what some people then called the communicative revolution. In some places it hasn't taken place yet, but uh, that's another story. 1975 was the year of John Munby's communicative syllabus design. And Bell, being a very forward-looking, forward-thinking organization at the time, had bought into the idea of communicative language teaching. So we had communicative syllabus design, communicative materials, communicative methodology. But did we have communicative testing? No way. In fact, testing isn't communicative anyway because of the nature of what it is. But we can have testing, and nowadays assessing, which is consistent with communicative approaches. In those days, though, when I looked at the tests that Bell had, they were like they came out of the ark. Things like, put the following into the passive. Now, if you think about it, put the following into the passive, we don't actually do that if we use the passive, we just use the passive. And the idea of putting something into the passive from the active is actually, um, it's, a, it's an artificial construct created by teachers to make the relationship between them. 
So one example of many, many that uh, were parts of the tests that I looked at and thought, I know nothing about testing, but I think even I can do better. And that was part of a long relationship that I've had with testing, and more recently with testing and assessing, um, which has taken me from 1975 through to standing here in front of you now. So when thinking about what I would like to do for this session, I thought it would be nice to review what has happened in this particular part of the world that I and all of you share. It's interesting, when I say how many to a group like this, how many of you are teachers? Hands up. Lots of hands go straight up. How many of you are testers? And yet you all are. Because testing, assessing, evaluating is a critical part of what we do as teachers. The whole gamut. Within testing from high stakes stuff, exams, summative stuff at one end, right the way through to a little informal class quiz at the other. So I thought what I would like to do would be to take you through half a century of experience of testing and more recently testing and assessing and examining. I said 1975 was a, a watershed moment for me. I've been aware of tests for much longer. I was subject to tests when I was at school. And the language tests then were grammar translation. I went to a grammar school. I studied four languages, French, German, Latin, and Greek. Too dead, too live. And I got tested on them in almost exactly the same way. Knowledge of grammar, focus on accuracy, translation from and into Latin, Greek, French, German. So things have come a long way since then. One of the nice things about getting a bit older is actually having a sense of progress. So I'd like to share with you and review with you the kind of progress that we've had in the world of testing and assessment. Hence, taking tea into the 21st century. It might seem a slightly odd title, given the fact we're now in 2011, more than a decade into the century, but in many ways, until quite recently, testing has been lagging behind. Not in every aspect, because there are exam boards in the world who have been very much in the vanguard of development, but in terms of the kind of testing I'm most often involved in, that within institutions, within schools, that which involves teachers, there tends to be a time lag. So, for example, in, in, in one of the areas that I've worked in a lot for, for more than 30 years, placement testing. I've run three conferences on placement testing, and every time the average age of the placement test used by the institutions represented at the conference was over 10 years old. I don't know why. In a world which is moving so fast, testing seems to lag behind. And I don't think it needs to. So part of me is wanting to be a bit evangelical and share with you, those who are not already experts, some of the things that are now possible in the field of testing. But before looking forward, I want to look back a little bit. So I want to explore with you very, very quickly a sort of express train journey in about 10 minutes through what I think have been the key changes and trends in testing and in T. And a couple of people have said to me, Dave, what are you talking about? What's T? T for testing, E for evaluation and examinations, and A for assessment. And they're not the same thing. And I'll come back to that in a little bit of detail shortly. So what are, for me, the things that have been most significant? And as I go through these, I'd like you to think about your own personal experience in this field and say, do you recognize things here? Am I still doing it that way? Am I moving in this direction? So for each of you, a kind of personal response to the thoughts that I'm going to share with you. First of all, I think we've moved very much from word and sentence level, discrete item testing, every item being separate, to the testing of language in context. And if there's one very, very strong message I'd like to get across right from the beginning, it's a passionate personal belief in the importance of context. Without context, we cannot make the form of language as meaningful as it needs to be, whether we're teaching or testing. 
So context, context is a vital, vital thing. From what I call a G and T approach, some of you will have, have had the same experience that I have had of being tested from a construct that in one sense was correct. If you teach through grammar translation, then you test through it as well. But believe me, from personal experience, translation generally is not a good way of testing language ability. It's a great way of testing translation ability. And I used to work a long time ago with translators from the Geneva Interpreter School, and there we did a lot of translation. But I rarely use translation now for my own personal testing purposes. From a focus only on form to a focus on form in relation to meaning. I've looked back just before coming here at a range of tests back in my sort of history, back in prehistory. And it's amazing how many tests were almost entirely concerned with the form of the language. I can see no reason for doing this without relating it to the meaning that the language is meant to have. And a focus on language as a formal system rather than language as a communicative medium. From testing only the rules of form to testing the rules of use as well. I'll give you a little example of this. We have a form of language in English which is almost unique. Question tags. You know what question tags are? No? Nespa? Huh? In almost every other language in the world they're dead simple. A single word with the right intonation. We Brits have got to make it complex and difficult. You can build a whole set of lessons around question tags. So, for example, there's all sorts of complex rules of use, like, see if I can get a bit of choral response. Put the question tag on the end of this particular utterance of mine. They'd never have their dinner early in Argentina. Perfect. The ones I heard, the ones who dared, were bang on. But if you think about that, there's a whole load of rules underlying in terms of form, but also the question of why we use question tags. And there's a lot of research went on over the years into why we use them. And it seems to me that part of what we can test is knowing when to use something as well as what the form is. You don't actually know a language unless you know how and when to use the form that you're familiar with. It was said about question tags at one stage that women used them more than men because women were being deferential. I haven't met many of them, but uh, that's what they said. Um, and uh, so women would use question tags more because they were checking that they were going to agree. <coughs> Margaret Thatcher, going back a while, used question tags a bit like a handbag that she was reputed to beat Mitterrand and Cole around the head with. So question tags can be used to impose authority as well. Just a single example of what we should test for is not just form, but whether people know how to use things in real situations. From most weight and marks being given to knowledge, to a focus on knowledge and skills. I mentioned to those who were in the session with me yesterday when we were talking about assessing spoken English, that I managed to get through the school system, get through all of the exams, because I could learn the knowledge. I was good at the knowledge. I actually managed to get through without having the speaking skills that I've always wished that I would have. The kind of speaking skills that we now take for granted, though we don't always assess for them as well as we might. This next one is a big one. From just testing and examining to testing, assessing, examining and evaluating. When I started in this field, 1975, on through to the early 1990s, people only talked about testing. The books were about testing. Nick Underhill, 1987, Testing Spoken Language. Testing for Language Teachers, and, 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 dozens of things on lists. You go to a conference, and it would be about testing. Go to a conference now, and for the last 15 or 16 years, and the two words come together, testing and assessing. And they're not the same thing. Very, very briefly, and it's not the same in other languages. So for example, in French, 
What I would call self-assessment is auto-evaluation. They've only got the one word. In Italian, it's valutazione. In your language? Evaluation is the whole thing. Coming to judgments about whatever we judge. And in English, the terminology of this field of English, we talk about evaluation when we're thinking about the what. Evaluating projects, evaluating courses, evaluating textbooks, evaluating tests. When we focus on learners, but we're interested in the process, or more correctly, the set of processes involved in determining how good learners' performance is, we call it assessing. Think of the familiar connotations and collocations. Self-assessment, peer assessment, portfolio assessment, continuous assessment. They're all about the processes we use, not only at the end to come to summative judgment, but throughout our classes. And one of the things I would like to suggest that we've got much better at, but I think we could still get better, is relating what we do in the classroom, the explicit criteria that we apply when judging as teachers moment to moment, day to day, week to week, how our learners are doing, relating that to what happens in the more formal, summative testing and examining processes at the end. And it seems to me we should be teaching and testing and assessing according to the same criteria. And that doesn't always happen, though we've had moves in the right direction. So, testing and examining are events. And the big difference between testing and examining, which I think is being clarified now, is that the purpose of exams is purely summative. They are there to judge, to grade, to give marks, to give grades, to separate the sheep from the goats, the dunces from the geniuses, and so on. Testing can be anything from high stakes at one end to, as I said earlier, informal at the other. So, I started off just thinking testing was about marking and grading. I'd never heard of giving feedback, <coughs> profiling, of diagnostic testing, the kind of thing we take for granted now. And I think I probably spend more time now, recently, on, in projects I've been involved in, on the formative side of testing, giving feedback to learners, than I do on the summative. I'll leave that to the exam board. From testing the memorizable to testing and assessing the memorable. And again, this links to the teaching. If we teach right, I think we make things memorable. If we teach in ways that motivate learners, if we teach real language, if we teach things that, as Danny in a session I went to yesterday was saying, if we teach things that allow us to make sense of what we're learning in relation to ourselves, in relation to our real world, then things remain memorable. And I'm much more interested in teaching and testing the memorable than the memorizable. I vividly remember my homework as a kid at school, learn a list of 10 words. Hard work, and I was dutiful and I did it, but uh, it's much more fun if things are memorable. From testing the predictable and the preparable to the assessment of spontaneity and flexibility and particularly in spoken language. For those who were with me yesterday, I mentioned this in some detail, but if the test involves testing of skills where you can do it in advance, or where only the hard work and being a conscientious learner gets you through, then we're not testing properly, particularly when we're testing spoken language ability. From testing written grammar, mainly, to testing spoken English and discourse in action, and again, I mentioned this in, in some detail yesterday. The grammar of written English is not the same as the grammar of spoken English. And so, when people get marked down for not saying things in a full sentence, that ain't doing it right. From norm reference testing to criterion reference testing. Hands up. Everybody who is confident about the distinction between norm-referenced and criterion-referenced testing. Okay, I think a little bit of explanation is obviously needed now. I don't go in for jargon, generally, but this is a very, very important thing. 
Norm reference testing compares learners against learners. It's interested in who's top of the class and who's bottom of the class. It's interested in who's an A grade and who's an E grade. Criterion reference testing relates language performance and the assessment, the grading of language performance, to that performance in relation to criteria that we have predetermined. So, as with the group I was working with yesterday in the workshop, if we think lexical range and accuracy and good pronunciation and appropriate language and, and, and are what we're looking for, that's what the judgment is made on. Many national testing cultures are so familiar with the purpose of testing being to sort out the best from the worst that this gets forgotten. And a lot of places I'm working in Europe, it is still the case. So, horror story from a place in northern Germany, which I share with people from time to time. Project I was involved in, introducing communicative teaching. Teacher taught brilliantly, learners learned brilliantly. She designed a test that was absolutely exactly the right thing. The learners did well. On their system, where one is ausgezeichnet and excellent, two is they're good, three is good, good, four is satisfactory and so on, they all got ones and twos, and they deserved it. The teacher put the marks into the head. A couple of days later, memo from head to teacher, come and see me. I wasn't there, but apparently the marks were flung back across the table. You can't do this. I want some failures. Bit sad in an educational context. So that happened because the concern was to separate people out. Testing as a social divider, even within the class. And it still happens there. There is an expectation, for example, in, in Bavaria, that you have to, as a head of a school, keep your marks within a range between two point something and three point something. And if they go outside of that, because a teacher's taught really well, it's not good. So, I'm a passionate believer in criterion reference testing. That it's much more important to judge learners in relation to how well they've performed. So, everybody could pass at the highest level, in theory, rarely happens for reasons we understand, everybody could fail. Again, from marks for content in tests which are called language tests, to tests marked for language only. This, of course, does not apply in clinical situations where the focus of the teaching and the learning and the testing and the assessing is on content and language together, where you've got to find out about both. But I work in a number of places where the judgment about the quality of the work and the judgments and the grades given are not just for language, but whether the learners are repeating the things that they were meant to learn in terms of content, or even whether the teacher likes what is said. From inward-looking individualistic criteria to externally recognized transparent criteria. I used to think when I was at university and I was judged that there were sort of God-given abilities that the judges judging me had, and that if I was given a 2-1 or a 1st or whatever it was, then that was absolutely, definitely right. Since being involved in university exam boards, I realized that is not always the case. But at least that's getting better as well. And at least we're moving from individual prejudice in many situations in terms of what people get their marks for to an awareness that there are criteria that we can apply across institutions, across nations, uh, in particular, something I'm going to be coming on to talk about, the CEFR, the Common European Framework of Reference, which for the last 10 years in my life has been a very, very strong support for the work that I do, but I'm not its slave, it's my servant. From tests designed by isolated individuals to assessment as a collaborative activity. I can't stress this enough. One of the best ways of improving the quality in testing and assessing within institutions is for teachers to get together and to talk seriously about it and work together and to share their ideas and to develop together. 
And when new people come in, if they've had training, for their views to be given proper credence. More than anywhere else, I think, with testing, the status quo rules. Those who are there in the institution already, they say, we've always done it this way. And they've got the power, the seniority, the authority, so it can be very, very slow to change. From test for the benefit of the teacher and the institution to test benefiting the learner. And I'll come back and show some of this in a bit more detail in a moment. I'll be silent for a moment and just let you read. I'm starting a cold, so my voice is suffering. Okay, some key dates just to sort of round it off and give you some reference points. These are purely personal. There have been some fabulous developments and fabulous books written, but I'm just picking out one or two. Going right back to the beginning, some of you may never even have heard of it, but a half century ago, Robert Lido's book on language testing, we've moved a long way since then, but it was a revolution at the time, moving us away from what was there then. 1973, the threshold level. And that was the forerunner of the benefits we've been able to have since from the Common European Framework. 75, I mentioned John Mumby and the beginning of the communicative approach. Keith Morrow, friend and colleague of mine, who brought out in 77 techniques of evaluation for a notional syllabus. Difficult to get hold of now, but a brilliant piece of work reminding us to look at testing in terms of the operations that people carry out in terms of functionality, in terms of what we can do with language rather than what we know about language. Something close to my heart, somebody who's been involved in teacher training, teacher development for a long time, a little book, you probably can't get it anymore unless you go on Amazon or something like that, but it was the first book that was really written for teachers about testing. And I think teacher training and testing has been neglectful. An awful lot of teachers do courses which cover many, many things very well, and through no fault of their own, they haven't had adequate training and testing and assessment. So it's a lovely little book that talks to teachers in the right kind of way. And then Nick Underhill, and I put a K in there, but he normally likes it with just NIC, and you'll find it, I think, on his book in NIC. He wrote at the beginning of this book, in his foreword, in his introduction to the book, I abhor the cult of the expert, this is for teachers. Experts are very important, but enabling expertise to be shared with teachers is important too. Muchas gracias. I only know a few words of Spanish, but some of the important ones. <laughs> okay, 1989, ironically, a conference called the Communicative Legacy, as though it was already over and leaving things behind. And yet in many ways, testing appropriate for communicative approaches, still a lot to be done. And then some interesting books. If you don't know it, the real beginning of looking at assessment as against testing, 1994, Harris McCann, 1997, Assessment for English Language Learners, and then the beginning of the CUP series, the CLA series, is Charles Alderson's Assessing Reading and the Common European Framework. And then we come into the last decade. And in the last decade, things have moved slowly despite the possibilities being there earlier. The appearance of the first big cat. Hands up how many of you know who... Yeah, try again. How many of you who know what a cat is in testing? No. A cat is a computer adaptive test. The test you do with a mouse. And as not many seem to know about testing with cats, I'll come back to that briefly and just show you how a cat works. Those who were with me yesterday know how important assessing speaking is for me. Brilliant work by Sarah Lewoma. If you read nothing else, get that. And then I've mentioned Oxford placement tests, which in one sense 
I produced, I, I designed the Oxford placement test, designed them in 1982. The fact that they are still selling as they are is testament to how slowly things move in a sense, but I did at least bring them up to date and link them, calibrated them properly onto the CFR in 2004. But then a couple of years back, finally things started to come to the market, started to be available to most of us out in the world. And that's the kind of things that I want to talk about now.